Let's now talk about earthworks and landforms. We've talked a lot about water management on a site and soil management. We're trying to slow the water down so we reduce erosion and we don't lose our precious soil and its nutrients. How we do that, we've talked a little bit about and we're gonna re review some of that, but go into more detail in this lecture. So earthworks are moving the earth around, the soil, the subsoil, creating structures and forms on the surface of the land that slow the water down, store it, sink it, store nutrients and sediments and reduce erosion. What are those forms that we create, the land forms that humans can do to manipulate and tweak the soil back into a positive regenerative trajectory. You're looking at a picture of um, the Lois Plateau in China. So Lois is sediments that have been deposited by wind. Um, and here was a very windswept, eroded and degraded hillside that was um, uh, formed using large-scale machinery tractors to create these large terraces but that was uh it, well they also planted along the the steep slopes of the terraces and then created these flat areas where they could do cultivation and also plant so what they did is took a very steep eroded um, landform and changed the landform so that it could catch and hold sediments and support vegetation Let's read this quote from Steve Grace, who's an Australian permaculturalist who specializes in earthworks. Understanding the flow of water and the water patterns across the land is the foundation of a fully sustainable system. It's essential to determine the mainframe infrastructure of interlinked earthworks that maximizes the use of water between the moment it enters our site through the moment it departs. This is the main objective of earthworks we can achieve it by slowing down the flow of water through the thoughtful arrangement and strategic placement and integration of various water catchment and distribution elements. So I've said that a few times in a few ways, but that was nicely put, but building um, systems of um, swales, dams, canals, ponds, terraces, gabion structures, all these things, if they're placed correctly and thoughtfully in relationship to each other so that the spillover from one in an uphill area fills the one right below it. It's um, sequentially slowing and spreading down water and letting it infiltrate. Slow spread sink. If there's overflow to one higher up, it flows into another one that slow spreads and sinks the water and so on and so on. And the more complex we can make it, the more it approximates natural systems. And the more we have building soils and um, higher fertility and less need for water and the more sustainable it is. Now, if you think about arid areas, desert areas, we're actually creating a system that's improving on that site ability to support humans and some wildlife. You know, we're, we might be increasing the amount of soil moisture by building these structures more than is natural. So sometimes that is the purpose too of permaculture design. It's not about making it perfectly natural or we would be called ecological restorationists. We'd be just habitat restorers. This is trying to create a system which integrates humans into the landscape and creates things they need as well as wildlife, not shutting out wildlife completely. And on any given piece of land, we are trying to make complex the line of movement of water from the source to the sink. So look at this little cutaway topographic mock-up piece of land here. It's a some kind of flat ridge with a valley with little tributaries going into that primary um, creek or river coming out at the bottom V, the bottom left there. So we water is coming in from the top and it's coming down into, into the bottom of that valley and then flowing down to the lower left of our image. And the triangle is representing um, movement of the water from the top and coalescing from the top in a wide scale down to a point and coming out. And what we wanna do as much as possible is make the movement of that water from the source, from the top part, 
down to the bottom, make it um, as circuitous as possible so it moves in a long fashion. We don't want it to quickly go down the slope and erode and go, and go off our page. We want it to move slowly um, and not very steeply throughout that site, snaking along that whole ridge and valley. And this would be a picture showing you schematically in the upper left the source to sink where the water starts from but having it slowly move in this fashion where it slowly goes downhill stopping in little reservoirs and ponds all along the way and that creates a slow movement of water it stays on your site a lot longer they call it increasing the residency time of water on your site and increasing the infiltration of water and that also increases vegetational growth soil development and lots of good stuff like that. Here's a overhead picture of Zaytuna Farm in Australia, part of Bill Mollison's farm there. And he did the exact thing that we just saw in the last image of catching the water at the highest point on his property, which is the lower left where the dams begin. And then each dam you see it's kind of triangular spills out. When it fills up, its spillover area slowly snakes down to the next dam and slowly around in these small canals with the degree slope in each canal is not over two percent so the water never moves fast enough to erode and it just it's a very gentle spillover into the next water holding structure all the way till it gets to the very end of the property and then the water leaves the property but having been used and a lot more infiltrated and a lot more support of growth and life and even livestock on that site because of that plan what are some of the tools we use for earthworks? As you might guess, like a laser level, you've got to know what level is and know how to map out slopes, especially when you're building swales and things that you want level, like on contour, a laser level is a great thing to use. If you're stuck though, in the middle of, um, let's say uh, the countryside in a foreign country or here, and there isn't anything like that available, you can use this thing called the A-frame, showing you at the two images at the bottom. Very simple, can be made with almost nothing except sticks and some twine, and you can find level with that tool, and we will use that in class. You can also use something um, like a hose. Um, water will find its own level, and you can use that in a number of ways, and one of them is water inside of a hose. It can help you figure out where to put that swale or that terrace, make sure it stays level. And of course, hand tools are often the only thing available in some rural areas. But if you are gonna use um, something, try to keep it to scale. Um, and bulldozers sometimes are appropriate for you know, pointed, limited um, time use, but to go in and do the major restructuring, building a dam, a pond, a large swale, get them in and get them out, and you won't have to do that again, sometimes ever. So it's just a one-time thing. This is a large, wide swale in Australia. And it's, so this is big, you can see it slopes up to the right and water slowly comes in and fills the swale in rain events. And the berm is on the left-hand side. So you've got the lower on the left and water's flowing in from the, the top on the right, flowing into the, into the swale, the ditch part of the swale, and then held in there by the berm on the uh, downhill side on the left. That water is not flowing any direction. It's just sitting there. It's a long level pond on contour, so it wraps around the contour lines of that slope. And there are a series of these, you're only looking at one of them, so water never moves too long across that slope before stopping and slowing down, spreading out and sinking in. Permaculture design often talks about this. We go from large scale patterns down to the details of how to use those big patterns to make the function at the small level um, just what we want. So from patterns to details, that's how some designing works too, in, even in clothing design, um, in urban design, you look at the big picture functions, you know, if you're planning out streets and accesses and things like that, it's not that different, but we're just talking about earthworks today. So you wanna look at the big scale patterns of water movement to know how to do the small scale um, elements that can um, mimic a pattern that you want and create the function that you want at the end. And how you're, how you're able to blend a number of functions goes like this. So first, look at the patterns of water on the site and think about how you will want to manage that water. Two, 
you also cannot neglect access patterns. How do um, people get from one place to another? How does livestock move from one pen to another? Um, those things are important because they're a little less um, flexible. Sometimes you have to make sure those access to things is going to be in place before you design your, your big swales, for example, across the site. You still have to have access across those swales with, with um, your livestock or your animals and the people too. So water patterns are the primary thing that dictates your design. Access patterns need to be also considered and then structural patterns, which are just where the dwellings and things like that are. But I'll go into more detail in just a moment. Let's first dive in a little deeper into water patterns. So as you've done, observing the flows, directions of water on the site, where the high points where water enters the site, that might be from the sky in precipitation, it might be from a spring, it might be from a runoff, and what are the low points, where are the gathering points of water, where does it tend to pool and puddle, are there pre-existing water elements on the site, flood zones, dry zones, dispersal patterns like alluvial fans, a place where the water slows down and really spreads out. Look, for, uh, look at the topographic features of the site, the contour lines. Look, find a topo map if you can, but then also look at the site. Where are the valleys? Where are the ridges? Where are the dry areas, wet areas? And key points is something I want to mention now. A key point is a place where the land goes from concave to convex. So look at this, in this image, you see a steep slope from the top of the ridge there in that little valley from the top of the ridge, you've got the land going, um, it's, it's concave. So you have a steep slope curving down and all of a sudden the land, um, the steepness completely subsides and it starts getting really flat. So it stops and then it spreads out. So if you think of it kind of in your mind, you've kind of got this downward curve, that's the concave, and then, and then it's uh, the slope levels out quite a bit and it, it becomes convex, so it's more rounded on top. That point between convex and concave, you can see in the picture, it goes from this kind of, oh, let's say brownish green on the steep slopes, like chaparral, and then this bright green, and then uh, dry grass yellow looking. So that point in the middle where the bright green is, is the key point. It's where water tends to come closest to the surface or come to the surface in a spring form on a slope like this. So those are really important areas to think about. That's a, a, a prime place you would want to catch water, the key point when it comes out. It comes to the surface. And um, that would be a great, great place for a little dam or a catchment basin or where you would start your um, a system of swales to catch the water. That's the highest point that the water comes to the surface on this particular piece of property. Another important thing to consider are access patterns. The roadways and walkways on your site, make sure there's good access between all different elements and points of importance like crop fields, the dwelling, animal pens, um, to and across waterways as well. Next, consider the structure locations and patterns. Where are the houses, dwellings, classrooms, sheds, animal pens, buildings, dikes, levees, swales? Where are they located? And are they positioned in a way that they will have reciprocity with inputs and outputs of each other, feed um, critical other elements, etc. So you want to think of that overall pattern as well. So you've got the water, the um, access, and structure patterns. All of those need to be seen kind of from a big picture, way high up in the sky view, of making sure they all work together and provide what is needed. Now let's take a look at ways to work with the water. This is uh, kind of going back to the beginning when water is the main thing that we are trying to manage on site and looking at these different elements as earthworks that are whose function is to gather the water and let it soak in. We've talked about swales, talked about the pit and basin method, which is also called a net and pan for very steep slopes, um, terraces, 
that hold the water back and create um, level ponds or just agricultural fields or beds behind those. And gabions, which are probably uh, the leakiest, meaning water is meant to come through them, through the rocks in those wire cages and hold back a lot of the soil and some of the water, but not all of it. So those are permeable, whereas the swales, pit and basins, and terraces are meant to be mostly impermeable. You can see a little diagram here of a swale. The uphill part has sloping down into the dugout ditch part of the swale, and then that soil put on the lower side where the berm is. All of the swale is vegetated um, and mulched, so you don't have any um, erosion happening there. This is a mature swale when you see these more mature plantings in it. But um, what happens with the water in the actual ditch part of the swale is the water will infiltrate and soaks in perpendicular to the surface of the bottom of that swale. And you're seeing that by looking at these arrows. So in other words, water will soak in from a swale in a large lens of underground stored water. And as that underground lens forms, um, increases the amount of moisture in it, and it joins in the underground water stored from the next swale down, that lens will join together and you'll get a large underground multi-swale lens of water, which can sometimes increase the ability of springs downhill to flow, um, have a higher flow rate or even come back to life if they've dried up completely. So swales are another water, um, a function of soaking the water in and nutrient collection as well. More detail on the pit and basin. On the left, you're seeing a picture from the permaculture designer manual, and um, it's showing you with an elephant in the picture. This is a type of design of a pit that would be used in a long linear fashion in a dry climate, also one like you're looking at like in Africa, somewhere where they might not have any wire fencing available and you wanna keep some wild animals out of your vegetable beds and gardens, you can dip, dig a deep pit, plant in it, the humans can get down in there, um, and that can collect water because in an arid climate, you're gonna have more water collecting in the low spots and also nutrients collecting down there too. Wind-blown sediments, water eroded sediments will collect there. So it, it improves the soil in your pit for your crops. And it also serves as a dry moat keeping out wild animals that cannot scale the steep sides of the pit. On the right, you're seeing a banana circle. That's another water soaking function type of pit or basin. And it's like a circular um, mound with bananas planted and other herbs and medicinal plants along that mound. And in the center is dug out a pit where you can throw green waste. And here they have a shower on top in the middle of that green waste center that can be put there and uh, the bottom can be lifted out if you want to put some stuff under it, but it's a way for water to be reused and, um, and meet the, the needs of the plants around it and a place for green waste and um, just an overall kind of nice little tidy design. I've seen these done and I've done one um, in Africa that's that put out right outside. It doesn't have to be Africa, but it can be any place tropical but right outside the kitchen. So where people tend to throw their old dishwater or cooking water, sometimes they just throw it out the window or out the door or nearby. But if you can put it into a place where it can help plants and grow food and um, create more um, composting occurring, all the better. Terraces are an ancient technique of nutrient and water conservation. They're done in a little different way than like a swale. So these are meant, they're usually done with vertical walls holding back water or soil, but creating a flat level surface for uh, cultivation on the top and done in this stepwise manner to be able to create cultivatable land on a very steep slope. Some of these, um, like for example, in Bali um, can be uh, over a thousand years old, the same exact terraces. They've been, you know, um, repaired and reinforced at times, but they're very, um, very intricate method of water management. How they're situated too is water that comes from the top um, slowly trickles down just as that maze of dams I talked about earlier on at Bill Mollison's Zaytuna farm. The water comes to the top and when it overflows, it overflows through a reinforced little notch in the terrace so water doesn't blow that out 
usually have some kind of planting in that little lower. On the top of the terrace, we'll have one little area that's lower and planted heavily so as water spills out, it doesn't erode and it goes down to the next terrace and down to the next. And that is a really great way of nutrient conservation. You do not get erosion and loss of topsoil in this situation. So these are really efficient and they're also great for water soaking. Of course, important for aquatic crops like rice, what you're looking at here, but even for terrestrial crops that would require really moist soil. This is a string of gabions, these um, wire cages that were made into this snake-like fashion across an ephemeral or seasonal creek out at um, Quail Springs in Cuyama. And um, so this also would be considered a water soaking function. So water comes down from, um, from the right in and hits this permeable, so to speak, um, dam and sediments and water build up behind that. Some of it comes through and some of it soaks in. So it is slowing the water down. And that when you ever slow it down, you get more infiltration. Gabions can also have a soaking water function. And this gabion here um, in the desert is just simply a rock wall, which would have the same effect as a gabion, just no wire cages around it. And it's considered a gabion style um, dam. Then there are other elements, earthwork types elements that are uh, meant for displacing water, moving it to different areas, not just stopping it and soaking it in. Drains, you have sometimes pipes that are used as drains, spillways, like I mentioned with the terraces, and benches cut out for house designs, roads, like a, um, like a big berm that some, someone could actually drive on the top or put a house on the top. It's up what would be called on a an earthworks bench as a level top and steeper sides. What you're looking at here is a level sill spillway, as we call it in permaculture. Um, and it's also called that in hydrology too. You have a swale here, um, and that is that water way that you're seeing. And then to the left center where the grasses are planted is the uh, berm part of the swale is lower. So it's one section of the swale's berm that is lower. So if that swale fills up to that level, water will spill out in this one directed area where you have plantings of grasses and other things that reinforce that area. So as the water spills out, it doesn't erode it. Because you can imagine if you just had um, one little area and it wasn't reinforced, once the water filled up in the swale and it started going through a little narrow notch that wasn't reinforced, it would erode that area quickly and you'd have a big blowout. So that's what a level sill, it's like a window sill, kind of a little bit lower than the rest of the berm. And um, what we're doing is we're telling the water where, if it's gonna overflow, this is where it's gonna overflow. We don't wanna just let it fill up on its own and find the weak point in the berm and blow that out. So that's what a spillway is. Drains can do this purpose too. You could have a pipe, kind of like in your bathtub, you get up to a certain level in your bathtub and there's that drain to make sure it doesn't get too high. The same type of thing can be done in a swale or any kind of water holding feature. And here's an example of one of those pipes that can be used as a drain as this small earthen dam on the right fills up. Oh, excuse me, it's actually a swale, not a dam. Um, as that fills up, it um, will, get it to a certain level and then go through the drain which exits. And then that picture on the lower um, left is the exit part of that PVC pipe that goes right through the berm of that swale to make sure it, it never gets too high. And again, if it did get so high that it got to the top of the berm, the water would find the lowest spot and start running out that way and quickly cause um, intense erosion and a blowout. And then there are earthworks that are meant just for holding water dams, ponds, and canals. Um, and canals are also meant to displace water, move them to another spot. And remember all of this, I mean, when you get into these earthworks, a lot of it gets pretty technical. You'd need an engineer, if not just an earthworks um, expert, like a backhoe expert who knows how to build these things. So our job as permaculturists uh, is to design the system and the technical details when you get into structures like what you're looking at, like a, a small dam, you don't have to know everything. You just have to have the ideas and the design and other people will know what to do. 
For example, I was told a story about this, this dam built at Zaytuna Farm um, by my colleague, um, Daniel Para Hensel, who I teach this class with regularly. And he's, he um, interned there at um, that farm in Australia for six months and watched dams being built. And you know, we would design them and think about them, is what he said, of where they should be placed according to where the water is flowing. But then the backhoe operator knew everything to do to implement that idea. So our job is not to build it, but to design it. And here is one of those dams at Zaytuna. This one is an older one. In the um, background, you can see the green trees on a green berm. That is the um, dam part of this, and we're standing at um, the uphill side, but it's all grown in. This is an older one, vegetated, and um, really serving its function well. A picture of making a new dam at Zaytuna. And a very simple dam made with hand tools. This is in near Ojai. Um, and it's, you can see the little earthen berm made on the downhill right side that holds up the water from this very small creek on the left side. But the creek doesn't run all year long. So this really holds and soaks the water in and helps the system around here be more supportive of vegetation. And let me just talk through a little bit about the landform reading and the introduction to that. Some of you may have experience with this if you're backpackers and you like to you know, orienteer. Um, but some of the things that you'll have to think about when you start to do designs are um, topography and understanding how to read that and what that means on the ground for the plants, animals, water, etc. One of the tools you have, which is great that it's so readily available, is um, Google Earth and overhead pictures of your site. You can get an overall feel for the major elements, access patterns, structures, a little bit about water movement too. But from water movement, you need another tool, which is a topo map. And topographic maps um, are just that. They're showing you elevations, and each line is a different elevation. And that line on this one, these um, reddish lines, are showing you the elevational changes throughout this um, housing development, this little part of the city, this is in Australia, but each line follows that elevation. So as you know, elevation um, curves around. If you wanted to, if you're on the side of a hill and you wanted to walk along that hill and never go up in elevation or down, you would end up curving around. You'd go curving into the valley and back out onto the ridge and um, like that. So that's where you get these lines, these are topo, topographic lines that help you can understand where the valleys are and where the ridges are and thus where the water will tend to go, where the watersheds are. If you look a little more closely, you can see these blue dotted lines. Those are the waterways. And you can see that they are um, in a certain pattern following the little indentations in the topo lines and the little um, kind of bubbling out of the topo lines between them. Like see where it says public recreation reserve Right under that word reserve, there's two little water courses coming together. And as they go down the page or up the hill, they go into the little indentations of those topo lines. So when you see that, a lot of little indentations kind of curves nested within each other, that's either a valley or a ridge. And you can tell by just um, looking at the topographic numbers to see what the elevations, see if the elevation is going up or going down. You can figure out if that's a valley or a ridge thus knowing where the water, major water flows will be. If you could look straight down on a topo map and then pull those elevations apart, and then you look from the side, you look at these kind of like cake layers, that's really what the topo lines are telling you. Now, obviously that's not how hills are. Hills are smoothed out, but this is giving you, um, in this case, there are 20 foot intervals. Um, it could be meters, they're probably feet of elevation change on this hillside. And so each kind of layer is on top of each other. And so when you look straight down, you're seeing that picture on the bottom on a topo map and you have to visualize it in 3D to really understand what are the hilltops and what are the valleys and the ridges to better understand water flow. So all these things we're gonna look at on site too in um, class in person, but just wanted to give you a little um, digital overview first. Let's look at this, let's look at this topo map um, first. It's very simple. This is in New Mexico. 
and a very flat um, topography. And you can see the red lines are the topo lines. And you can also see the blue dotted lines are the water courses. And so those the lower lying areas are little valleys. And you can see now how the red lines, the topo lines kind of curve in um, right at the um, water course. And try to look at this for a minute and decide, okay, which way is the water moving in that central section where it says number 12? Is that little dotted blue line, is the water moving to the upper left of, of this picture or the lower right? And try to figure that out by looking at the topo lines and also um, the elevational changes. And here are a couple more technical ways you can figure out hill slope from a topographic map, looking at some of those conversions that you see there, and also looking at the average slope of a site um, by looking at the topographic map.